Well, hello all. I'm I'm John Ruff, and I'm the moderator of this uh, exciting session. We're going people are just trickling in at this point, so we're just going to wait wait just a few more seconds to um, see if we can fill up the room, and then we'll go into introductions. But hope everybody's having a great time in this conference. I certainly am. I'm calling. This is afternoon for me. I'm calling in from Boulder, Colorado. I don't know where everybody else is, but um, And our presenters, one is in, in Richmond, Virginia. And Nancy, where are you? Where are you? I'm in Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas. And uh, uh, Linda, you're in? I just moved <laughs> to Dana Point, California. Oh, ah, OK. So we've got four different time zones. We do. Makes it very complicated when we try to get together for meetings. <laughs> Okay, I'm not going to waste any more time, but I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Dialogue as a Cultural Change Intervention. And uh, I'm particularly excited about this. I know it's going to be an enlightening. If I weren't moderating, I'd be sitting on the front row anyway. Um, and uh, hopefully everybody's read the full session overview and the platform. Few housekeeping notes, please um, stay muted through the, the, the presentation. There's not going to be any interaction uh, maybe until the end, but maybe not even then, because we've got such rich presentations. So there's really not going to be any Q&A session. If you've got some questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and also put your email address in because uh, the three presenters will be happy to respond to those by email. But that's going to be your best bet on that. If you've not already seen the handouts and the resources on the platform, they're amazing. Absolutely. Five different resources. Um, one, two particularly from, from Harold Clark about the background on the Virginia Department of Corrections and what they've done. It's, it's, it's truly amazing. Uh, so do check that. They'll be available for at least a week after the, or a week after the conference ends. So you can get them then. Um, I don't know if anybody has any technical difficulties, but uh, please alert uh, Jenna through the, uh, the chat and uh, maybe they'll help. Let me, we don't have a corporate sponsor for this event, but uh, I want to make special note of the Academy of Professional Dialogue, of which these three presenters are board members and officials. And um, it's, it's important that I'll put the link in the chat, uh, but as they gave the Department of the Virginia Department of Corrections the designation of dialogic organization. So uh, for those of you who are dialogue uh, watchers and junkies, if you will, uh, and followers, uh, this is going to be an amazing experience. Um, so give me a moment to uh, introduce our, uh, our presenters. Um, they really do bring uh, significant depth, significant depth in the, in the field of dialogue, which I've studied for many years as well. But our, our main presenter, Harold Clark, um, uh, grew up in the Canal Zone in Panama. After college in Nebraska, he joined the Nebraska Department of Corrections in 1974 as a counselor. He rose through the department to become warden at the Nebraska State Penitentiary in 1987. In 1990, he was appointed director of the Nebraska Department of Correctional Services, which he held until 2005. Uh, and then at that point, uh, took on a role as secretary of the Washington State Department of Corrections. 2007 took on a new role for uh, commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Corrections, talking about a resume around the country. Eh? Um, in November uh, uh, 2010, Howard Clark was named the director of the Virginia Department of Corrections, appointed by Governor uh, Robert McDonald in 2014, appointed, reappointed by Governor Terry McAuliffe, uh, and then in 2018 by Governor Ralph Northam. Uh, Harold has received many awards uh, throughout his career, including a legacy award from the Association of Women Executives in Corrections, 2007, and most recently, Tom Clements Innovation Award by the Association of State Correctional Administrators. 2016, Mr. Clark was inducted a fellow of National Academy of Public Administration, NAPA, was chartered under Title 36 of the United States Code in 1984 by President Reagan. He's also a trustee of the Academy of the Professional Dialogue. 
Linda Eleanor and Linda Wave uh, is, is the founder and senior consultant with the Action Dialogue Group, which founded in 2015 and former co-founder of the Dialogue Group, founded in 1992. During the 90s, she ran five-day retreats training organizational development practitioners in BOM Dialogue. She has a long background as an executive coach with the Center for Creative Leadership, was a career change consultant with Drake Beam Moran for, for many years and co-author of the book, Dialogue, Rediscover the Transforming Power of Dialogue, Wiley and Sons, 1998. I highly recommend it. It's a brilliant piece of writing, Linda, uh, which has been translated now into four languages worldwide. She continues to work as a consultant specializing in dialogue and technology of participation methodologies. She currently sits on the U.S. Board of the Academy of Professional Dialogue as vice president, runs monthly global dialogues along with video recorded interviews and seasoned professionals with the Bohm Dialogue community. She holds an MBA from Columbia University, BS from New York University, has completed a PhD program, Jungian Psychology at the Pacifica Graduate Institute in California. Nancy Dixon um, is, is, waving, is the CEO and senior research Research at Common Knowledge Associates, um, commonknowledge.org. We can put that in the chat as well. Before founding Common Knowledge Associates 2000, she was professor at GW, George Washington University in DC for 12 years. Before that at University of Texas in Austin. She also a PhD in administration with a minor in psychology and uh, sociology. She currently an adjunct professor at Columbia University in Information and Knowledge Strategy Program. She's the author of Common Knowledge, How Companies Thrive by Sharing What They Know, Dialogue at Work, and the Organization Learning Cycle. The focus of her work is on helping organizations become learning organizations through dialogue, collective sense-making, and knowledge management practices. She is also a board member of the National U.S. Academy of Professional Dialogue, where she conducts, conducts monthly interviews <clears throat> with leading theorists and practitioners of dialogue. Her latest thinking can be found in her blog, nancydixonblog.com. So I'm excited to turn this over to this, these amazing presenters. Please help me welcome them. And uh, I'm going to pass the ball to Linda Eleanor. Thanks so much, John. Well, I, I want to just start by saying what an honor it is to actually present this case to you. Um, uh, I'm going to say just a little bit about, about sort of the framing of the corrections um, field first by kind of telling you a little bit about my journey to dialogue and why I find this case study that Harold will tell you in a moment to be just amazing uh, to, our to our field of organizational development practice in general. So. Back in the late 80s, early 90s, I had my own practice. I was mainly doing team building work and executive coaching, as John suggested. And it seemed like when I would, was doing team building in particular, you know, as practitioners, we can kind of clear out the communications pipeline of problems, <laughs> which there always are many, but they always come back, right? You know, in a year I'd come back and the, team, the same team would want me to do the same thing. So I kept wondering, well, why can't we find a process, a way to help them help themselves. So when I first discovered dialogue, um, and I was very lucky, I was able to actually study with David Bohm um, and in one of his last uh, seminars in Ojai, um, it was like uh, a miracle come true because he had a way of explaining how we can think together, learn together and interact in ways in an ongoing way so that we have continuous learning and we're not constantly at each other's throats about who's right and who's wrong because that after all is kind of the American culture, right? <laughs> and he had this idea about fragmentation. Uh, he was a quantum physicist, of course, and he, could, he, he knew of course that the world was radically interconnected, but we humans with our way of talking, we fragment everything and then we form subcultures and little groups, divisions, silos, we know that from our organizational work, uh, but we don't really, we didn't understand, or we haven't understood exactly how to behaviorally help people interact in ways that are healing. And Harold will tell us how he 
brought a healing environment to the corrections field. Now, when I was doing my work in the 90s teaching dialogue, um, how to facilitate it, mainly my focus was on private industry. I wasn't so uh, I, I wasn't so focused at all on public agencies and hierarchically driven organizations. And I knew that Peter Garrett, I knew the name Peter Garrett, and I knew that someone like Peter Garrett was doing work in prisons in the UK. And I thought to myself back in the 90s, why would anybody work in prisons? <laughs> so I left the field after the 90s. I did a lot of different things. I got a degree in Jungian psychology. I wanted to understand more why it was difficult for people to let down their defenses and talk even more uh, interpersonally, efficiently and effectively. When I came back into the field around 2015, I noticed that Peter Garrett had founded the Academy for Professional Dialogue. And of course, I wanted to know, well, where is dialogue after about 15 years? Where is it being used now? Who's using it and how are they using it? So um, when I got involved with the Academy, that's how, I, of course, I met Nancy and Harold. Suddenly, I got why Peter was working in prisons. <laughs> and you're going to hear Harold's story in a minute. But I want to say something that really stood out for me. Um, I especially uh, understood it well from this book, which is in your resource um, section, uh, called Healing Corrections, The Future of Imprisonment. Uh, this man, Chris uh, Ines, I think that's how you pronounce his name, uh, he tells Harold's story, but he does it from an OD perspective. And I, I thought it was very enlightening in that he, he explained that those organizations especially corrections and other public agencies that are what we might call command control or high reliability organizations, or other people just say hierarchically oriented organizations, why they really can utilize something like dialogue. Um, I never would have thought that. I would have thought it was just the opposite, but it's not. And Harold's story will show that. Uh, it actually takes a structured approach, and Harold will explain the structures he used so that dialogue is spread within his entire organization. Um, so I was just smitten by his story and how successful he has been to take a communication process and actually see it change a command and control culture. Not that he did away with the hierarchy at all. I think that's what many of us think in the OD profession. Um, so I'm not going to say much more other than really study uh, and listen to what Harold did. This book, Healing Corrections, is a wonderful primer, and the resources that we've left you with will also give you more background. Um, so I think it's a phenomenal uh, OD uh, breakthrough that we have. So Harold, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda, for that introduction. And uh, I just want to uh, thank you all for uh, allowing me to uh, be a part of your uh, conference. So today, what I'm going to do is to share with you my story, uh, my story and how uh, we use dialogue uh, in uh, the different places that I've worked uh, for the last uh, uh, 20 years or so, perhaps now, or even more. And uh, so I'm going to begin my story with at the point when I became a warden in Nebraska. And I became a warden in Nebraska of the state's maximum uh, uh, penitentiary security unit uh, in 1987. And I inherited, as you all know, a, a top-down hierarchical uh, organization. I grew up in that system, beginning as a counselor and becoming a warden. And so I had a chance to see the system operate in, in all of its glory. And I wanted more. I wanted more uh, in terms of how the system was to operate when I became a warden. And I wasn't satisfied with the outcomes that I was getting. So I decided that I will study leadership. So I went to the National Academy in Colorado for several years, and I took every course that they offered in leadership. One of them required uh, was a residence course for a whole week. So I went to Boulder, Colorado for a week and stayed there and studied at the academy uh, uh, leadership. I, I um, studied with them for so long, taking all of their courses, that eventually they decided to make me an adjunct instructor. <laughs> so I started teaching uh, leadership at the academy uh, in Boulder. 
And um, so I went back uh, to Nebraska and I implemented all the things that I learned in leadership, but I was still not uh, fully uh, satisfied. And But it must have worked for me because shortly after, within uh, this over three years of beginning the study, they promoted me and made me the director of the system. So in 1990, I became the director of the uh, Nebraska Department of Corrections. And it was then in 1990 when I became director that the National Institute of Corrections introduced me to the concept of future search. So I decided to have a future search conference in Nebraska to help us with our organization development and our culture and uh, so forth. And uh, I found, the, I found the, uh, the conference to be very, very useful, very, very helpful. Um, it helped us uh, in terms of uh, working with stakeholders, both internal and external stakeholders. It helped us to develop a shared vision, which is very important for any organization. It also helped us uh, uh, solidify our mission and come up with values that the Department of Corrections uh, held in concert with all of its uh, stakeholders. But it was limiting. It was limiting in that beside helping with vision, mission, and values, it only touched a, a small portion of our population in terms of people who were involved in the experience, involved in the conference, which is a two and a half day uh, experience. And uh, so most people, they, they, have, they, they saw that the, um, the vision was changed and the mission was slightly altered and those things impacted them, but they never got a chance to figure out how they could play a part in impacting the culture of the organization that will create, create uh, that lasting impact and that lasting uh, uh, change that we're seeking. Um, I wanted an organization in which people were engaged. I wanted an organization that wasn't just top down, but I wanted an organization in which every voice was a voice that was heard and that was valued and that there were structures in place to cause that to occur and that people knew just how to cause that to happen. While at the, um, the conference, the Healing Environment Conference though, something happened, I'm, I'm sorry, the Future Search Conference, something happened uh, that impacted me then and uh, has stated me up until this point. And that is, while we were uh, talking about vision, we did an exercise of envisioning the ideal state of your organization or the ideal state for your organization. And I sat there during that conference and I came up with a thought of having the department, having every prison be a healing environment. Because how else can you uh, realize benefits for everyone? So I thought about a healing environment, thinking first of a medical model and then a pristine environment. And staff in Nebraska were very, very, very receptive of uh, my introduction of that concept. But I made a mistake in Nebraska, and that is I set out to define for staff what the healing environment was. But everyone is going to have a slightly different image in mind about a healing environment, but there will be some obvious connections as well. So it went okay, uh, and um, but I um, later on learned as I went from Nebraska to Washington, Massachusetts, and Virginia, that I should engage the staff in in deciding what what's the healing environment and what that looks like, and that that logically in Virginia we were able to do so. So let me uh, share with you the definition that our Healing Environment Council comprised of a variety of staff came up with here in Virginia. The healing environment is purposefully created by the way we work together and treat each other, encouraging all to use their initiative to make positive, progressive changes to improve lives. It is safe, it is respectful and ethical where people are both supported and challenged to be accountable for their actions. 
So that's overheating environment concept that drives pretty much all of our activities today within the uh, Virginia DOC. So I was invited in about the mid 1990s to join the uh, Shell Dutch Corporation in Woodlands, Texas to study dialogue. These folks realized that I was still in search of something more than I'd gotten from a future research conference. And so I quickly accepted the invitation and went to Woodlands, Texas to study dialogue uh, with the Shell uh, Corporation, uh, some of its, its executives from all across the world. And it was a week long session in uh, Texas. While in Texas, I had the privilege of meeting Peter Garrett from England and uh, Dr. William Isaacs, uh, who at the time was with NI, uh, I'm sorry, um, was uh, working in Massachusetts, uh, but he was running the College of Dialogus as well in York Harbor, Maine. After a week of studying dialogue with the Shell executives, I was impressed with dialogue. I could not wait to go back to Nebraska and get dialogue training and the implementation started. One of the things that stuck with me was how dialogue was being viewed, how it was being uh, described. And I'll share that definition with you. Dialogue was described at that training as the art of first talking together, thinking together, learning together, and then being able to create and make new meaning together. That is precisely what I was looking for when I became a warden, a way of getting everybody engaged, everybody involved, everybody thinking together, learning together, and creating new meaning and new opportunities together. Dialogue gave us a common language as well as we think and talk together. And I recall envisioning dialogue as that vessel into which we can place all of our problems, all of our challenges, all of our opportunities, and making sense of them using their logic skills and practices. So I left that training and the journey in Nebraska began. Immediately, I introduced my thoughts and ideas to my executive team. And I must say, say to you that my three deputies were not impressed. My three deputies kind of like, this guy went to Colorado and bred that thin air and came back with these crazy ideas. And we are, so, we are just not impressed. We're not sold in that. So I realized I had a challenge. I didn't want to get off on the wrong foot, so I was not going to force anyone to do anything. So I spoke to individuals in the organization, a layer below the deputies and others to gauge interest. And a lot of folks raised their hands. And so I said, okay, bingo. I'm gonna send you to training. I'm gonna send you to training. And I sent them to training in Maine with Bill Isaacs at the College of Dialogus. They came back pumped and excited about the training uh, that they had in uh, Maine. And so I went to training myself because it was important for everyone to see me modeling the things that we wanted. So we made a commitment uh, in that, uh, to dialogue and uh, we sent then wardens and others to training and it worked out very well. We then brought Peter Garrett. We made a commitment and we brought Peter Garrett uh, and his colleague Jane Ball from England to Nebraska to train our staff in dialogue in Nebraska. And that training went very well and was very well accepted. We trained all of our executive team members and so forth in this dialogic skills to include check-ins and check-outs, the seven dialogic modes, uh, dialogic actions, and dialogic practices. I then left Nebraska feeling good about dialogue it was infused in a good portion of the agency, but not totally. So I left Nebraska and accepted the same position in Washington State as the Secretary of Corrections for Washington. I again invited my friends, uh, Peter Garrett 
and Jane Ball, who are now becoming like family. I put them all across from England to Washington State uh, to train our staff in Washington as well. I did the same thing in Massachusetts. When I left Washington after three years and I went to Massachusetts to become the commissioner of corrections in Massachusetts, I took them to Massachusetts uh, with me as well. And we train primarily leadership. We focus on leadership and training them in the dialogic uh, skills. It was well received. People thirst for dialogue. And it was very, very well received. There were skeptics until you explain to them what you were doing and you explain to them the potentials and the possibilities. And then they quickly uh, fell uh, in line. But I was still struggling and wondering how we were going to get dialogue to everybody within the organization. And so in Washington State, we began to toy with training trainers, dialogue practitioners. And so we trained six dialogue practitioners in Washington to use dialogue throughout the organization. And then I decided to leave Washington, went to Mass, did the same thing in Mass. But after three years in Massachusetts, I left to come to Virginia. And again, I brought my friends and colleagues now and almost family, Peter Garrett and Jane Ball with me from England to Massachusetts. And they came to Massachusetts pretty much every quarter beginning in 2012. And again, this did the same thing we did in the other states, provided uh, training in the basic dialogic skills, beginning with leadership, because I felt leadership had to buy in first. And if leadership did not buy in, we we're going to have a hard time selling it all the way down through the ranks uh, in the uh, organization. We made a commitment of time and re re uh, resources. We reallocated training dollars to be able to afford the uh, training for the consultants. But then we decided we had to create sustainability. And we could not rely on consultants just coming and providing that training. So that dialogue practitioners training that we started in Washington State with six people, we started in Virginia with 24. Well, to make a long story short, today we have right about 275 dialogue practitioners in Virginia. And these people are located strategically in, in proximity to all of our 46 prisons and all of our 43 probation and parole districts. We are responsible for 68,000 individuals in probation and parole, and we are responsible for right about 37,000 individuals incarcerated, and we have a staff complement of 13,000 staff. And the dream is to have dialogue reach everyone in some form. So this dialogue training that we're providing is allowing our staff to be able to train and to also use it as interventions to, to problem solve, to assist others with issues that they may be facing. So we built a structure to support it. So we created a top position of a, uh, a dialogue and business practice administrator. And then below that position, we have a statewide dialogue administrator and they have a line to the 275 dialogue practitioners that are positioned all across the system with a responsibility of making sure that ongoing training is taking place, there are ongoing interventions, and uh, people are fully aware as to what dialogue is and what we're all about. We still continue, however, our relationship with the, um, the, uh, the International Academy of, uh, of dialogue and Peter Garrett and Jane Ball, as mentioned, are members there, and we're still fully uh, engaged with them. So we have done a lot with dialogue. We have also put dialogue to work, and we have um, we, we use dialogue uh, to help staff understand how they can best respond to the needs of the inmates that are sent to us, how we can help make them better people, how we can help to resettle those individuals in the communities. And we have a process called the Offender uh, Resettlement Journey, where inmates who have been discharged now come back and they walk staff through a process from 
the point that they came into the system and all their movement through the system to the point of discharge and help staff to understand how they could have done better by way of engaging them while they were incarcerated with us. We also have another process that we use in putting dialogue to work called a working dialogue. And this working dialogue uh, is, uh, is being used extensively now throughout the department and is used in problem solving and in thinking together. It requires a setup where we identify the issues and people impacted, and then we talk about a current situation and what that current situation is. We talk about a, our focus on a desired outcome, follow the desired outcome, what changes are required to get to that desired outcome, and then, fo uh, then follow through in terms of how it will play out. And those are basically the five steps. And between each of those steps, there are what we call gates. And before you can go from one to another, you have to answer a, a ser several questions to make sure that everyone is on the same page. And all of this is accomplished all of this is done using the dialogic skills. We have also put dialogue to work in the area of coaching. What a better place to put dialogue to work? Teaching supervisors how to work with subordinate staff and how to coach subordinate staff as opposed to just focusing on disciplining that same staff. You help them to become better as opposed to correcting, which, which oftentimes leads to problems and eventual leads, eventually leads uh, to terminations. And um, there's so much that we're doing at Dialogue, we don't have enough time in this, uh, in this session to share with you today. So I'm just giving some examples of things that we're doing. Uh, one thing that we do with Dialogue is we have learning teams. All of our 13,000 staff to include myself, the director, is a member of a learning team. And learning teams are anywhere from eight to 15 individuals. And they meet twice a month, minimally. And the learning teams use dialogic skills to address issues that may be impacting one or two of them, or issues that are, that are impacting the department as a whole, uh, or the director may say to the learning teams, hey folks, there's an issue I want you all to focus on and think and talk about and get your feedback back to me. So it's almost like a, a way of doing focus groups, lots of focus groups all over the, uh, the, the agency, which is the largest state agency in Virginia and get feedback from those learning teams. And again, everything is done using those dialogic skills. And so what's next for us? We have begun training inmates in dialogue. It's been, we started that several years ago, but in very small numbers. We have not made a commitment in making plans to train all of our inmates in dialogue because it's important that, that, that only when they're here with us in the agency, that they are able to communicate effectively with themselves and staff and to think and make better decisions. We're infusing dialogue into all of their therapeutic groups and into their cognitive communities. Uh, and at the conclusion of that, if we are successful, when they leave us and when they go home, they will use their dialogic skills with their friends and their families and in every environment in which they find themselves. And that, that is one thing that staff tells us as well. Many of our staff say to us, you know, this dialogue is great. It works great at work, but you know what? It works very well for me at home with my spouse and my children because it's the same basic skills that can be used in any human interaction that can get you the results that are necessary. So I think I will stop there and uh, because I can uh, go on for, for some time uh, talking about uh, dialogue and experiences and I'll stop and uh, uh, allow Nancy uh, to uh, make some comments and then we'll feel any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. That was great. That was, I, I've, um, I've heard Harold's story, story several times and I'm inspired every time. So it was, it was very nice. Thank you, Harold. Um, what I did in preparation for this meeting today was that I went uh, and, and talked with some people at, at VADOC 
and ask them some questions about how it was to work in an organization of dialogue. And one of the questions that I asked was, how has it changed the way you work? I asked two or three other questions, but, uh, but um, uh, I, I've asked uh, someone to put together a little, um, the, the, the three people in a little video that I'm gonna, it's not a very fancy bit of video because we just sort of did it uh, by ourselves, but I want you to hear some of the people that work in the system and their thinking. So I'm gonna show you a video. The first person to talk is Andy Gibson, who's a logistics manager at VEDA, um, Brian Flattery, who's a project manager for administration, and then Catlin Maiklin, who's a program director in substance abuse. And then finally, I'm gonna show you Carrie West, who is that person that, that Harold talked about, who is now responsible for dialogue across the, the whole system. So I want to show you these three, and and, and uh, again, just uh, just to listen. It's very short, two minutes, I think, it is about what it'll take. But just have have a listen. As dialogue helped that helped you do that. You know, I was thinking before the interview. I'm not sure if I'd be sitting here today if it wasn't for dialogue. Um, just the difference in a department um, eight or nine years ago. I've, I've been here just over 10 years and the department is a lot better place to work today than it was back then. And, you know, if it, if it stayed the way it was 10 years ago, I'm not sure if I'd be here talking to you today. So that's... Dialogue's been very impactful, not, not only as, as my role as a project manager for administration, but in previous roles, it's been really a positive influence on my communication skills. It, it really provides me and others an opportunity to uh, provide my genuine voice and also to utilize, you know, active listening skills and, and interact and engage with individuals. I don't always have the luxury of doing so. Um, I'm able to uh, process information through suspension and active listening to really... Uh, it has helped tremendously um, in my role. Um, I facilitate staff meetings twice a month. So we make sure that we're having quality meetings. We use dialogue to talk and think together about specific changes that might have occurred in our treatment. If there's a new assessment tool, we, we talk about whether or not it's um, for the best, we look at the pros, we look at the cons, and then I can then communicate with my supervisor some of the feedback from the field. So I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna show you one more. I have to stop sharing to pull it up though, hold on. This is Carrie West, who's the, um, the, the um, coordinator across the system for dialogue. You can see that one, right? Okay, okay. So th this is I, this question she's answering is, I, I and in fact you'll hear me say it a little bit. To what makes it work? Why does it work at Vedoc? Is the question I ask you. in a lot of other places. What what's gone on that makes it work? Well, I can tell you that we have been practicing. Now, when we think about when we think about dialogue, you have to practice. Um, we have we we have utilized dialogue in our organization and and used those business practices of um, creating learning teams and having open two way communication with our uh, our superiors, but having that ability to feel like you have created a container with that container development. We have actually, at this point in our career, we are affecting the field. You know, you're going from realizing yourself to showing up, and we're now affecting the field. We are modeling for other agencies how you can have open communication with your staff and receive valuable input. When we think about... I, I, will, um, I will stop it there. Um... I wish I could show you all of these, all of these videos that I, I had because, you know, I, I, I have the such admiration for you, Harold, 
of, and what you've done, but my goodness, I have admiration for these people that I listened to and interviewed and, and, what, and, and their firm belief in the importance of, um, of, of dialogue in their work. So that's been very impressive to me. And why don't you unmute yourself so I can ask you a, a question or two before we, we stop. Sure, glad to. Okay, so you heard what Carrie said about what makes it work. And she named, mm -hmm. I thought, some really good things. So what would you say if you were, if someone was coming to you and saying, okay, what are the three biggest things that you ought to do to make this work in your organization? What would you say? Well, I think, first of all, you have to include people in the vision with you. You have to be able to sell your vision and answer that question of why. Why are we doing this? And if it doesn't make sense to folks in terms of if it's not going to have an impact on them to make them or their organization better, then you're wasting your time. So I think you need to, first of all, have a clear vision, include others in that vision. That's why a shared vision is so important. And uh, the Future Search Conference can help with that in helping creating a shared vision. But as, as I said earlier, those are limited in scope, but it, but it can be helpful, it can be useful. Secondly, I think consistency is very important. You have to stick to your message. You have to model the way. And then third, I think you have to be willing to make an investment of time and resources. And that investment means also changing the way that uh, you have done business previously. For example, to bring Peter Garrett and uh, Jane Ball um, wasn't, wasn't cheap necessarily, but we just had to take a look at how we were spending some of our resources and change how we're doing business. So we change a lot of training resources and so forth to be able to bring them to town. But, but there's a lot that goes into it besides those three things. And I think one is having a belief of the good in people and working with them to have that displayed. And if you, because people will see that, people will know that that's what you're attempting to do, that's what you're trying to do by how you engage with them and how you, you, how you treat them. And dialogue again, provides you with those skills of suspending your judgment. And it provides you with those skills of listening without pretense. That you, if you practice those things, people will come to realize what you are doing. So uh, I know when we've talked in the past, Harold, uh, I have I've been very impressed about your background. And I asked you before, and I, I'd love for you to repeat it again. I asked you, what in your life, in your growing up, in your, in your background, led you to hold this set of beliefs about people and the goodness in people? And would you talk a little about that? Oh, sure. Well, I, I come from a large family. Uh, uh, I'm one of nine kids. And uh, my father was a minister. And um, pretty much everyone in my family, they're professionals otherwise, but everyone has a connection to ministry. Uh, and, um, and it seems like as they retire, they all go back and become ministers or evangelists or whatever. Well, my ministry has been corrections. I didn't go into the ministry. And correction is my ministry. And I just believe in the good in people. And I believe in giving people chances. Uh, in this business, we have to give people first chances and second chances and sometimes third, third chances and to, to see the good in them. And that's why as a motto in the Virginia DOC, we say that we are in the business of helping people to be better. It's all about having that belief in people and giving them opportunities, giving them chances to succeed, no matter what they may have done that got them to prison. The fact is that better than 95% of those incarcerated are going back home someday. And how do you want him want them returning back home? Angry and upset because of they, they were treated while incarcerated? Or do you want somebody who have learned the error of their ways and how to engage and how to communicate more effectively in the community? We credit the work that we are doing with the fact that for the last five years, Virginia has had the lowest rate of recidivism in the United States. And the, the, the one year that we did not, we're not the lowest, we were the second to lowest. 
and our average rate of recidivism has hovered right about 23%, while the national rate average is right about 46 to 47%. And do you credit that, do you credit dialogue with that? Oh yes, yes, I credit dialogue with that because dialogue, as I said, is that vessel that we can place all of our challenges within and it will help us to make sense of them. It will help us to be able to engage more effectively as we address them, either challenges or opportunities, and it help us to come up with a much better product. So it is that idea that, that if you've got all the minds working on the issues, that mm -hmm. helps you not only understand, but find solutions to. Exactly, to and that's why, again, the definition of dialogue is that the art of first talking together, thinking together, learning together, and then creating new meaning together. Yes, yes, that's beautiful. So I'll ask one more question, and then uh, Linda, if, if you found some questions in the uh, in the chat, then you might turn to those. But you know, my very last question is, is, of all those things, Harold, what is it that you're most proud of? The thing that I'm most proud of is my staff, really and the work that they're doing. They are really engaged. They, they really want to make a difference. And you know, when we tell people about our, our model, for example, we're in the business of helping folks be better. And people say, and you are a prison system? Yeah. They say, you're missing the ball somewhere. <laughs> you know? But that's indeed what, what we're trying to do, make people better. Because as you make people better, they make better choices. They go out there and they create less victims. And uh, they, their, their children, have better beginnings as well. And we, we, cur we, we cut that cycle of crime and punishment uh, because there are others that depend on these offenders that, that are incarcerated. But I'm most proud of my staff and their commitment, their dedication, the hours they put in, uh, in trying to be true to our vision and our mission. That's wonderful. And, and having met and talked with many of your staff, Carol, I, I can understand that. I don't think I've met a one that isn't just fully committed uh, to, not only to dialogue, but to, to that vision of helping people be better. It's, it's a wonderful vision. It inspires me constantly. So thank, thank you. you. I'll turn it over to Linda. Thanks, Nancy and Harold. What a wonderful talk. Um, yeah, I'm so impressed and proud to be part of uh, learning about how you're using this in the prison environment. Uh, one question did come up, uh, whether there's been any uh, studies that have been done. And I do know the Urban Institute from other talks you've given have done quite a bit of studies. Maybe you can comment, Harold, on that. I'm on sorry, I was I, I was uh, reading one of the chats. I didn't fully hear your comment, your question. I'm sorry. One of, well, one of the chat questions that came up was about how or if uh, there's been any studies done on how dialogue has impacted uh, your culture. And I think you Yes, as a matter of fact, um, we started almost right away having our work studied. And uh, we, in, we got a grant uh, in 2012 to invite the Urban Institute in to conduct uh, uh, surveys, surveys of all of our staff. And so the Urban Institute came in and they did a baseline study. And they came back two years after that and did the same thing. Uh, they're quite expensive and our, our grant ran out. So after them, we contracted with the, uh, the Virginia Commonwealth University to come in and replicate the same study. And they did it for a few years. And now that we have the credibility, our research department has now been doing those studies, basically using the same format that was used by the Urban Institute when they first came in. And they ask a lot of questions about the healing environment, uh, they ask a lot of questions about dialogue and so forth. And what we have seen since these studies began every year in 2012, we have seen the approval level and numbers going up, 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 and up. And what we've also seen, a figure that, that, that I find impressive, is when the first study was done, uh, one of the questions in the survey was to our staff, do you believe that we should lock inmates up and throw the key away. And simple question, that response was double digits. It was almost 19% of her staff at the time said, yes, 
a lot of people have threw the key away. The survey, which we just got the results of about three months ago, 4.6% said lock him up and throw the key away. Amazing. And so change is being realized, and progress is being realized. And this is an, an anonymous survey, and we don't know who is saying what. And that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in the culture and how the culture collectively is responding. Harold, a couple of questions have come up, uh, Paul Gowen and Daniel Loeb, uh, primarily around where else would you say uh, what you've done would be most applicable, like within, say, the VA organization, perhaps within police organizations. I know one thing I got from reading the Innes book, Ein's book, is that um, especially uh, public agencies can utilize the very approach that you use because structurally, the people within them, they don't particularly want the hierarchy to go away because they need high reliability. But what they really yearn for is a more informal communication environment. So maybe you can comment more on that. Well, I think dialogue will work in any environment. Uh, it may be an, an hierarchical environment or a one with a flat structure. It just basically requires a commitment from leadership to do it. Uh, and once you have that commitment, and then you put a structure in place to sustain it, and then you set out to train and teach people about it. I don't know of anyone, quite frankly, I don't know of anyone who after having a chance to study dialogue have said, I don't like it. Yeah, I, I think the thing that, that I am most impressed with is that you really stuck with it. I know many people in the 90s tried to implement dialogue but there's so many changes within any organization. So if a leader starts a dialogic process and isn't there for long enough to hold the vision, it mm -hmm. can dissipate quite. Yes, exactly. And it, it all begins with leadership and it ends with leadership. And if a leadership is committed, it can occur. And so I have been director here now in my 11th year in Virginia. Uh, and people are very comfortable with what we're doing. Uh, most of the staff today, uh, I mentioned we have 13,000 staff, uh, say probably uh, two thirds of that staff have been here since I got here with retirements and turnover and so forth. And so this is what they know. So this is now part of their culture. And so for you to, to stop doing certain things in support of dialogue will not be well accepted by these people because that's what they know. That's what's working for them. Them. That's why I think it's so important for leaders to focus on the culture, to try to change the culture and to put structures in place that can sustain that culture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the combination of teaching the actual skills involved, which is the behavioral component. Exactly. And, and then reinforce it with structures so that they continuously practice it. I think that's what a lot of organizations in the 90s, at least, weren't doing, so it didn't take hold. Um, we have a question from Paul about uh, whether or not you've tried to talk with DOD, Department of Defense, about your results. I have um, made presentations uh, on dialogue to the State Department, and uh, I have uh, shared it with um, a number of other departments of corrections in the United States um, uh, through the Association of state correctional administrators. And some people picked up on it, some have picked up on it. And uh, when they when they leave, it died out. And that's, I think, because they, they, they didn't have the robust training, they didn't have the structures in place, so for, for it to continue on. And that's why they don't survive. But, you know, I'm reminded that um, if you have two ideas, a good idea and a bad idea, and if you don't nourish that good idea, but you nourish that bad idea, that bad idea will get you better results than a good one. So true. It all depends on what you nourish and what you pay attention to. Yeah. If you so nourish the good one and the bad one alike, the good one, of course, will excel. But if you ignore it, you will get no benefits from it. Yes, yes. I was impressed, Harold, to hear how much leadership um, development you did and education you did so that they even asked you to teach leadership courses. One thing that the, the Eins book uh, suggested though, that a lot of our OD theories and practices that have to do with leadership 
are really meant more for the private sector and mm -hmm. not so much for the public sector. Did you find that to be the case? Well, of course you found dialogue, but it probably wasn't taught in your leadership classes, no. right? No, it was, <laughs> that it was for the private sector. I just happened upon it. And when I went to uh, training with uh, Dr. Isaacs and uh, Peter Garrett in New York Harbor, Maine, it was an international group of folks from all across. There were folks from Africa and Germany and Switzerland and England and, and others there as well, representing all the private sector. I was the only person there representing government, right. from government organization. But all of those companies were private companies and they're usually large and successful companies. And uh, again, I was introduced to it by the Royal Dutch Shell Corporation. They invited me as a guest of theirs to come and spend a week with them, studying dialogue with their executives in Texas uh, at one of their training facilities. And that's how I got involved in it. But this is not something that is often offered to the, uh, the uh, to government you know, and the public sector. It's something that's usually kept in the private sector. But the, the dialogic skills that are trained apply in every environment where there is human interaction. Yeah, it simply takes vision, which you had, mm -hmm. and it takes consistency in approach and structure. I absolutely get it. Thank you so much. Any right. other questions that anyone has? We don't see the full screen, so I can't see hands. Um, I can. Maybe um, I don't see any hands at this point, but um... And we're getting close to the, the close. And if you do have, again, questions in the chat, we can certainly get back to them. Um, uh, we, I think we're going to get a hard stop at, uh, at the hour. But if there are any other questions quickly or put them in the, put them in the chat, I uh, wish this could go on for another couple of hours. Mm -hmm. There's, yeah. there's so many nice comments in, in the chat, Harold. I know if you've had time to read them, but people are very appreciative of, of what you've said today. Yeah. And yeah. I think inspired by it. And, and I, I see Daniel <laughs> waving yeah. his hands. Well, thank uh, you. So let me just let me just say thank you to these three amazing present presenters for their richness and their depth. Uh, several people have said this is the most powerful uh, presentation they've heard in years. And I totally agree. Um, don't forget there's a session evaluation. Ought to be something we all pay attention to. And there's a there's a networking break that's coming up and the uh, the award for elevating humanity and dialogue uh, with uh, Otto Sharmer at, uh, at 2 p.m. I guess that's Eastern. Um, any event coming up, that's the next thing. So let me just say thanks from all of us for the richness that you've brought to us. Harold, particularly, uh, it's absolutely amazing. And I hope that you can, I mean, personally, as a veteran also, Hope that you can take this into, uh, and you can help us take this into those areas, the police police departments as well. I think it has so much promise, and you've demonstrated it. And let me so, just say that it's the, that I that is the goal of the Academy of of dialogue, both the U.S. and international command. The the uh, motto of that is that the world needs dialogue. It's pretty so. Thank you all very much. We've given you uh, the ways to contact these presenters. So please reach out to them and I, I'm sure they will reach back to you. Uh, but this is a conversation that is, is needed in all quarters of our society right now. So, And uh, thanks thank for having me. And uh, we're glad to take any emails and questions from anyone of you. Much appreciated. Thanks for having me. Thank you all greatly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jenna, over to you.